Hi guys, welcome back. So it's been a minute since we've done a founder story. This is one of my all time favorites. I wanted to tell this story earlier on, but honestly I was doing so many food founder stories. So I was like, Eve, chill for a second do some other founder stories and then you can come back to this one. So this is the story of Hamdi Ulakaya and how he made Chobani. We all know Chobani at this point. I mean, it's like a household name. We all know the, the delicious Greek yogurts. However, when Hamdi was creating Chobani ages ago, early 2000s, the kind of yogurt that we had in America was mostly like Yoplait and stuff like that. So what he brought to the American yogurt industry is quite prolific. Also, he came from the middle of nowhere in Turkey, small town in the mountains. So his trajectory from, you know, boy who grew up in remote farming village to owner of a multi-billion dollar food company. It's what these kind of fairy tale like stories are always about. His level of just compassion and grit throughout the whole story is incredible. And anyway, I will stop teeing it up and we can just get right into the story. Hamdi grew up in a remote village in Turkey, like I mentioned, extremely remote. They had very little connection with even the nearby cities. They would go there to buy supplies sometimes. He was part of a family that had animals and they would make cheese and yogurt all the time. As he got older, he started going to college in a town nearby and was starting to realize that Turkey might not be the place that he wanted to spend his entire life. He was kind of thinking of where else he would like to go a bunch of his friends had been spending time in Europe doing some studies there and that was kind of where his mind was at. He was talking to a friend one day while he was out shopping and talking about wanting to go to Europe. The shopkeeper heard him talking and he was like, no, 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 don't go to Europe, go to America. And Hamdi was like, I don't want to go to America. I'd much rather go to Europe. So he goes home that night after saying absolutely no to America and he's kept awake all night with this nagging feeling like he's got to know more about going to America. He goes back, finds that shopkeeper the next day, and he asked him, he was like, well, tell me more about America. You know, why would you tell me to go there? And this guy was like, oh, I actually studied there for a while, and I know someone who can connect you with a program in America where you can study abroad. After hearing a little bit more about this guy's experience in America, he was like, you know what? I've got this big intuitive feeling like I should go to America. I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna get in contact with this study abroad program. Long story short, he starts studying in New York, but obviously it's a really tough process for him. He has just moved from a very remote area to Baruch College in Manhattan, can't speak English, doesn't have a lot of money, and isn't quite sure if he's made the right decision because he feels quite isolated. And he's going there and one day his English teacher has them write an essay and the only prompt is how to. He decides because he's such an expert in making cheese, here's a whole essay on making cheese. The next week, this professor comes up to him and she goes, I would love to invite you up to my farm this weekend because I actually have a farm in upstate New York and I really want you to teach me how to make cheese. And he is elated by this. Like once he gets the invitation, he's preparing to go to this farm all week, so excited. And when he gets up there and they spend the whole weekend making cheese and he's hanging out on a farm, he says that he didn't even know farms existed in New York. He was like, well, you know, that's what I know from like the mountains in Turkey. I had no idea you can access a farm this close to New York City. Has the best weekend ever. And he speaks to his professor and he was like, what are the chances that I can figure out a way to do school remotely? And again, this is not COVID times, this is late 90s. So remote school isn't normal. And he was like, what, is, what are the chances that I can do remote schooling and work at this farm all the time because this is what I'm passionate about. So she says no at first, but a few months go by and they work out an agreement where he you know, will live at the farm, take care of all of the operations, make the cheese and we'll get free room, board, all of that. Um, but he just has to transfer up to Albany and then he'll drive take classes there, come back, take care of the farm. And this to him is like a perfect agreement. He's so happy. And this whole time that he's here, he's thinking when he finds feta cheese out, it's not it's not like mind blowing or anything. And then his dad visits from Turkey and his dad is speaking to him and he was like, you're spending all this time making cheese and you say that there's all this like very low quality feta cheese available. Why don't you start making feta cheese? 
and, and selling it in America. And originally his idea is to import it from Turkey, but very quickly he, he changes to producing in America. There's so many things to work out. He's got to buy a bunch of ingredients. He's got to get the equipment, which is, is quite costly. There's these huge vats you need. He goes to get a loan, is approved like right away, and he hires about 10 to 12 employees and, and they're making this cheese. And he realizes very quickly that in Turkey, a lot of the time he was, all the time, he was using unpasteurized milk and milk straight from the farm. And in America, we, we have to pasteurize our milk. We, we have to do all these things that kind of take away the quality that he wants to bring to making feta cheese. And also the margins were not really that great. He came to America end of the 90s, starts his company, 2002 and it's coasting for a few years but he really feels like he made the wrong decision and honestly he says that it was like the worst few years of his life by 2005 they're doing about two million dollars in sales they've got about 40 employees at this point two million dollars sounds like a lot of money but when you've got poor margins 40 employees all of your production costs they're really just scraping by that is when Hamdi gets a letter in the mail one day it's an ad for a yogurt plant nearby being sold by Kraft it's for sale for $700,000. So he throws the letter away and he's like, well, I don't make yogurt, like whatever, out of sight, out of mind. And after he throws it in this trash can, he's got this like intuitive feel to like go back and take it out and look at it again. That same intuition that told him, go to America, don't go to Europe. He's looking at it and he was like, well, what's the harm in just calling the number on the ad? He calls and they were like, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, not the most updated factory, but you can have it immediately and he was like wow this is so cheap like even if i buy this and none of the equipment works there i could i, I could still even use it for what i'm doing or i could flip it like seven hundred thousand dollars for a factory is extremely cheap from what he says the next day he's viewing the factory and of course there's a lot of things that need updating but it's in pretty decent condition but he says what really sold him he realized that this entire town's economy was based on that factory when Kraft moved out of there so many people were put without jobs and these were people who like they worked there but their father had worked there and their grandfather had worked there and you know it goes back farther and farther and farther that kind of gives him some inspiration to take over this factory and give everybody their jobs back. And then in addition to that, he was thinking and he was like, I'm not loving making feta cheese. I don't think it's for me. And I love yogurt. Everybody in Turkey loves yogurt. We eat it with like every meal. The yogurt that we have in Turkey, similar to the feta cheese, I guess, is so much better than what's available in America. He was like, you know what? There's a huge hole in the market in America. Their yogurt's thin. It's not very rich in flavor. I can bring that thick, yogurt that we have that again we know is greek yogurt but was also you know extremely popular in turkey and he was like i'll bring that to the forefront of the american yogurt experience he buys it he gets another loan to cover that the summer of 2005 is just fixing it up and it's actually incredible because similar to what i was saying with all the staff who still lived in that town he could easily transition into a new staff because you know he hired the same operations manager that was there before. He hired the same woman who was friends with all the ingredient producer or all the ingredient suppliers, and you know it was just a very easy transition. Finally, in 2007, the factory is up and running and actually producing finished product. He has four flavors that he wants to to come out swinging with. One other key thing to mention that he he really emphasizes in what made Chobani so successful is that they had different packaging. We walk through the grocery store these days and every aisle you'll see very creative packaging in weird boxes and different shapes and colors and funky text. But back in the day, you didn't really want to go too out there. And also like there weren't as many options for like suppliers and what they could do. Anyway, he was very keen in having a distinct yogurt cup that didn't look like any others on the shelf because he knew that his yogurt tasted so good where if he could get one person to pick it up and try it because of the funky packaging he could sell them as a customer for life because of that flavor once they've opened it so packaging was huge and that shows that he was a very forward thinker because like I said it would be 15 years until people really understood the power of packaging and now it's oversaturated still matters but 
It's a whole different thing. They're starting to get into stores. They're in a bunch of like mom and pop shops. They're in small chains. They want to nail down their first mass chain. These are really big for food companies because if you get into one of these and, and you get in front of people and they love your brand, I mean, that's the thing that kind of takes your brand off to the races. You, It's very hard to scale in an efficient and economically viable way if you're just spreading to more mom and pop shops around the nation. He's in talks with ShopRite, which is a chain on the East Coast of large grocery stores. The thing with chain grocery stores, you know me and have watched my past videos, you know my history is working in the food industry. If you get into these big stores, you have to pay them an insane amount of money just to get on their shelf. And if you don't perform well within like three months, they'll just remove you. He had to pay $120,000 per flavor to get into these shelves. So, you know, he's got four flavors, that's a half a million dollars. And so you have to pay a half a million dollars up front before you even know if your brand is gonna succeed at this grocery store. So what also happens to a lot of brands is that they'll take a shot on one big retailer, pour a bunch of their money that they really shouldn't be spending into that one, hoping that it'll work. And then their brand will go bankrupt within the year because that was their one shot and they blew it. However, Chobani is the success story of this because he was talking to the manager and he was like, okay, look, I don't have this money. Like I can't give you it up front. And so they're trying to work out a deal because I think he thinks Hamdi is like very passionate and is very charmed by him. And so they work out an agreement. They're like, maybe we can take out that money from all the incoming payments that we gave you for, for what sales are made. But the, the manager is still like, okay, but like if you don't sell a half million worth of product, we're still out money and I need to pay my guys. Hamdi tells him, he says, if my products don't sell at your store, you can have my factory. Which again, he bought for $700,000. So it'd still be a loss for him. So the ShopRite guy kind of chuckles and says yes. And they are now in ShopRite. And the beautiful thing is he says that he gets a call two weeks later from the same manager and he goes, these are flying off the shelves. Like I cannot keep them here. And another good insight that Hamdi says that he did was not only did he have the, the beautiful packaging, he also priced them lower than the competitors. Cause if he underprices it for two months, he can get by doing that, but he can only do it for two months. And he's giving himself that leeway to hope that people, because of the price and the packaging, try and, and start mass buying it, which is what happened. Like people are loving it. So quickly after this, he gets an order from ShopRite for 25,000 cases. That's an insane amount of yogurt they have to produce. And he was, he called and he was like, hey, when do you need this? Like, is this your order for next month? The ShopRite manager was like, no, this is my order for next week. And probably gonna be that the week after, if not more. So all of a sudden, and this is also what kills brands sometimes, is that the overnight they, they they scale very quickly and they don't have the facilities to actually meet that demand. If you remember the video that I did on the Boom Chicka Pop founders, this happened to them when Trader Joe's took them on. They basically had to find this sketchy loan overnight to give them like, it was like $150,000 that they needed to make all of this product. If you wanna watch that video, it'll be right here. It's a great one. It's also one of my favorites. Chobani's factory has to start working 24 seven. Again, their understaffed are just going absolutely crazy. But he said that everybody was down to overwork themselves and come in on holidays. You know, they knew it wouldn't last forever and they would like, you know, level out eventually and, and hire enough people. But while they were understaffed and, and had so much demand coming in, they knew that like this fact, he, him coming in and buying this factory made it so that their town's economy could still be alive. And, and this factory, because it had been in the lives of so many generations of these people, it, it was a real personal thing for them to go above and beyond and make sure that Chobani succeeded. And while he's thinking of the next way to like just mass hire a bunch of people because like I said, they, they just need so many new workers. He hears about all of these refugees coming to Utica, New York and how there's loads of refugees being placed there but they can't get jobs because they don't have you know means of transportation, they don't speak English. It really strikes him because you know that wasn't him very long ago. And so he decides, he was like, you know, these are gonna be my new factory workers. We're gonna hire cars and buses, we're gonna hire translators, and I'm gonna give these people jobs. And that's exactly what he did. You already had this existing community of the factory workers there, and then you had a whole new community coming in. And he said that everybody working there honestly was like a family, which is also great. You, you find that so many successful companies, a lot of it comes down to just good company culture and having very 
decent people at the top. By 2010, he's doing $216 million in sales. I know that was a fast forward, but I mean to remind you, he opened five years ago. Within five years, he's doing $216 million in sales. And one thing that's really interesting to note is that Hamdi never took investment. He grew all of it based on you know the, the revenue he was bringing in, the profits, he would use that to scale further. Also being five years in, a lot of the big guys have, had tried to buy him out, which is honestly many food founders' dreams. Like, the, a lot of people want to sell to the, the big, bad, corporation because it's a good payout and a lot of the time they also have the staff that can help your brand scale further. He was not okay with that. He didn't want to sell back to, to someone like Kraft, you know, the people who had his factory before him. He wanted to keep seeing how far he could bring Chobani and to him it was never about the money. Like five years in, he is still sleeping in like a one bedroom apartment. He doesn't spend any of his money because he spends all of his time working at the factory. Most of his excitement from life has been from from scaling this company. He doesn't really know what he would do if he like retired tomorrow with billions of dollars. And it was billions and billions that he was being offered. We're kind of ending the, the, the founder part of this story. This is when they are full-fledged business. They started in 2012, building a new facility out west. And around this time, because Chobani really insisted on not having preservatives in their yogurt, they're starting at this new facility. There's like a little bit of an error. They have to recall so many products because of mold. And it was such a large recall that it almost sent Chobani into going bankrupt. He almost gets to the point of having to file for bankruptcy. It's like the night before. And he ends up getting approached by a private equity firm in 2014. They're not buying it. They are just getting a very big equity stake in the business. This money saves Chobani. These people seemed pretty solid and he's been very efficient with scaling it. The 2014, that's nine years into the business. And if he wants to take it from a very large food company that makes Greek yogurt to what it is now, which you know, there's like non-dairy milks, they've got creamers, they've got so many things. He knew he wasn't able to take it to that very next level that maybe someone who worked in private equity and, and whose job was helping large businesses scale 10x further. That's when he decided, yeah, to partner with this firm. That's pretty much the whole founding story. I mean, we all know Chobani is still an incredible company today. As of 2021, Chobani was worth $10 billion. In 2022, they almost went public, but due to market conditions looking a little hairy, they decided to draw back, which Honestly, I don't blame them. The The economic landscape right now is not ideal. I'm sure that going public will be on the horizon for them, you know, in the next few years. Hamdi Ulakaya is now 50. He's got a beautiful family. He's worth billions of dollars and he spends a lot of his time these days doing philanthropic endeavors. He is one of those amazing founders. I love when I hear founders who, you know, are worth billions and have pledged give 99% of it away, or maybe it's 90%. But what I do know is he's guaranteed to pledge $700 million of his wealth to helping Kurdish immigrants, just like himself. He really is an incredible success story, and he is so passionate about lifting up the next generation. I really encourage you to listen to not only the How I Built This episode, which is where I got a lot of the information in this episode, but also just watch a bunch of YouTube videos of him, watch his TED Talks. It's clearly just so good-hearted still, even being worth billions. This was kind of the whole story for today. Again, I love this story so much. I, I hope that you enjoyed it. So grateful for this opportunity to just hang out and talk about cool founders doing cool things. Thank you guys so much, and I will see you in my next video.